Welcome to the Business Performance Podcast, where we feature expert thought leaders and cover their best strategies, stories, and advice that you can use to successfully mature your own business performance. Now, here is your host, business coach, Henry Schneider. Hello, everybody. This is Henry Schneider with the Business Performance Podcast, and today it's my pleasure to talk with Fernando de la Pena Yaka of AXA Aerospace. He's the CEO and president, and he is also a small business owner and he supports the NASA community. So, Fernando, welcome. Thank you so much, Henry. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Sure. All right. So, to begin with, would you please describe briefly AXA Aerospace, the type of work you do, your customers, and the services or products that you provide? Well, AX Aerospace is a small, uh, decent, batch business. Uh, we are a federal contractor uh, for NASA. We provide astronaut training using holographic technology that we develop. We own that software. So that allows us to train astronauts and payloads, especially it's, uh, in Texas and in Alabama at the same time, or they could be on the space station and somebody here on ground and they can train and work together. Uh, we also have other customers like Lockheed Martin. We are manufacturing um, some components for a spacecraft called Lucy. Uh, we have other customers called Raytheon. We have uh, we are a subcontractor for the NDL, the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, where most of the astronaut strength is the biggest pool on Earth. And mm-hmm. uh, we are also working with Teledon Brown Engineering. That's a contract at the uh, Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. Okay, wonderful. So when you start um, working with your clients, what's the importance of the quality of what you deliver to your clients? Well, quality is everything. Uh, there is always a line that you need to see if you are going to provide quality, time, or money. Uh, our first priority is quality, but then we need to begin with some smart ideas from my team to try to make it uh, at the right price, at the right time, and the best quality. So it's always try to innovate, trying to provide a new idea, and quality is always the, what is important, especially for a small business, in my case, if my customer, they they don't like what I'm providing, they just can walk with the next, next uh, guy, the next vendor. So there are several vendors in line, so quality is extremely important. Okay. So uh, what, are, what, what are the biggest misconceptions out there when it comes to you know, working with augmented reality um, in terms of quality and performance? Well, um, it's a huge challenge. Uh, in this case, uh, let me describe, we work with mixed reality. Mm. So we have virtual reality. Virtual reality, you have uh, some goggles, and you are inside of a computer-generated uh, environment. Mm-hmm. Augmented reality is like Pokemon Go. You can interact with your environment and you can see uh, like a digital sticker. That's augmented reality. Mixed reality, it's a combination of both. I can have my glasses. I can interact with holographic objects or persons, like if they are real objects, I can just grab it with my hands and manipulate those objects. And those objects also can interact with my environment. So, for example, if I'm just uh, throwing uh, a holographic cup and I just throw it on the table, it will bounce on the table. So, mixed reality is a step beyond augmented reality. And in our case for training, it's a very uh, important tool that can, or at least is reducing a lot the money that costs to train and build expensive mock-ups. Okay. So do you have, in your simulations, I guess, well, I guess that's what they are really, um, do you have haptic feedback too? So like if you're going to go there and interact with a box, you can actually feel the resistance? We have some devices that provide that haptic feedback, especially a glove. So essentially you can feel some texture or some resistance. So you can see, okay, this is an object. One of our customers in the medical industry, uh, we were working with, uh, training for physicians in Canada. Um, we provided uh, a scalpel, and that scalpel has that force feedback. So essentially, you can feel if you are cutting uh, skin, or you are 
getting close to the bone. So yeah. depending on the customer, we we tailor the tools that they need to oh, okay. use. All right. So um, so what's the biggest challenge that you, you that your company currently faces with business performance? Well, the biggest challenge is uh, I'm trying to compete with large businesses. Mm -hmm. um, I want a big contract that is a large business is try to get and um, I won. So, but the biggest challenge I have uh, just few employees. I don't have all the resources that they have. Uh, so that could be a challenge trying to compete with the big guys. However, that's a huge advantage. I can move very fast. Mm. So it's like, okay, I, I don't have all these people, but that you can say, okay, we are going to go on that direction. Mm. So that's, that's important. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's good to be flexible and nimble where you can you don't have the inertia and overhead of a large company. <clears throat> However, good. we are getting there. Yeah. Um, we are um, CMMI Maturity Level Three. That's mm -hmm. a quality certification for software. So essentially, it's like an ISO quality certification. You need a procedure for everything. What it's very good uh, if for some reason. I'm not here or my, I need to hire more people. We already have the procedures in place so anybody can resume the work or increase the workload if we want to. Okay, so that, that, that was thinking along those lines too. Then it was, it's more, more or less with scale. As you, if you grow and scale up, does your current system allow that or do you have to go back and retool things? No, the current system, uh, the CMMI certification and other procedures that we have in place, um we're designed to scale our capabilities so essentially if i need to uh, have more people developing software or manufacturing i just can't do it because we have all the procedures um when i made my company in 2012 i always aim to be a large business and uh, that's the reason because i'm expending a lot of resources trying to have all the resources that we need in terms of quality procedures uh, training so we can scale very easy okay all right so um so what are some of the common uh, challenges that you have with trying to scale past performance uh is like a catch-22 you you will not have your first contract unless you show past performance with the federal government you need to show the last three contracts mm -hmm. in addition to that uh every time that we are trying to get a new idea uh, we need to prove the last three contracts about that new idea. So that's a huge challenge. Uh, we are getting there, but I can tell you every, every time that we are trying to compete with big guys during the contract recompete, uh, that's one of the main challenges. Well, that's some, almost like a catch-22 because you need the past performance to get the work, but you can't get the work without the past performance. <laughs> Correct. So how, do, so how do you get over that hurdle? Well, um, the easiest way is to be a subcontractor in the beginning. So that way uh, you can have that past performance that you need. Also teaming agreements or joint ventures. Um, I can talk with another company and say, hey, I can provide this. You have the past performance. I can provide a service. And then you team up with companies. And that way you can get a contract and that will count for past performance for my company. Okay. So you were so you I guess you've done that now. And so now have you won contracts just for your company? Or yeah. You, okay. Because I remember talking with you a couple of years ago, you were trying to get over that hurdle. It was very hard. The first contract, it was a huge catch twenty-two. Um, and at the end, a a large company tried to get that contract. So it was hard and it was in Alabama. So I'm in Texas, it was a different state, uh, different people, they they didn't know me by that time. Um, a large company was trying to get that with past performance and re reputation that I didn't have by that time. However, innovation is what helped me to get that contract. Yeah. Innovation and transparency. So I saw a photograph online with you and the President of the United States here recently. So can you tell us a story of how that happened? Well, um, that was my fourth time with the president. Um, I was just invited, business business stuff. Um, 
that picture is not complete. That full picture is with my full family. Yeah. Um, I was invited to Mar a Lago to another event. Then they uh, every and I took my son with me mm -hmm. by that time. So my daughter was like, "Hey, you didn't invite me." I said, "Well, let me see if they invite me again. I will. I will tell you, uh, and I will invite you." Um, then I received an invitation. I said, "Well, um, now uh, can I invite my family?" Sure. So they allow me to uh, visit my with my family to Ben's Minsters, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So we flew there, and we we had a very nice time with the president. He was great with the kids. Uh, the, the side the side that I know about him is he's a real estate guy. He can be very charismatic very he's he can explain things so easy mm -hmm. uh, my kids they are 11 and 8 mm -hmm. uh, after that meeting they can tell you about the situation about north korea and mm -hmm. what's happening with china and why tariffs are important because the president is very good trying to explain so it was a fantastic experience yeah that's that's, that's unique not everybody is able to have that experience you know um i remember I guess it was after the Challenger disaster, being at Clear Lake and walking down on Space Center Boulevard, and I saw the president go by in a limo with him. It was George Bush and Laura Bush at that time. But you don't get to see them very often. Yeah. Well, um, this president is very close to Houston. I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. uh, this this post podcast is not about politics, but yeah. uh, in that a term, in terms of the space industry, we can see that things are moving forward. We are getting more opportunities to innovate, to grow. So it's good. Yeah, you know that that's that's so refreshing because I've noticed that too. There's more energy now. The problem is we've lost a lot of the brain trust because of this, what's happening. So now you have to reinvent the wheel basically because you're, in, you're ingesting all new people that don't have that background and the long history. You are absolutely correct. We lost uh, thousands of employees in at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We lost thousands of employees here in Houston. So trying to retrain that people is hard. In addition to that, uh, there is a lot of stuff that you cannot find. Like, hey, can you please share me the experience when you had that special launch and you had that issue, how you did it? It's very hard to find the documents. Um, and the ex expertise is very hard to train somebody with that expertise. So yeah. we are getting there, uh, but it, yeah, it, it was very, very tough, especially yeah. we need to land on the moon by 2024. Yeah. And I remember working with United Space Alliance many years ago when I was looking at the SRB team and was asking about their requirement stocks, and they couldn't find them either. Because it was if they had inherited from somebody else, and they'd have to go back and slowly recreate things as they were mm -hmm. And that's that's you know that's a shame that you lose that knowledge. I agree with you. And right now, it's a shame there are only two countries that have the capability to send humans to space: Russia and China. Mm. Twenty years ago, it was only the United States mm. and Russia. Right now, we rely on Russians. Uh, hopefully by 2020, we'll have at least uh, Boeing's vehicle, SpaceX vehicle, and Lockheed Martin vehicle to launch humans again. But we lost that capability. So right now, if we want to send the humans, we need to buy tickets with the Russians or the Chinese. Yeah, I know. With SpaceX out now, what's is pretty cool is that they're, they're launching and coming straight back down, just like uh -huh. you see in the old science fiction movies where the tripod comes out and it lands. Now that that is pretty cool. If now all you gotta do if you can get all the way up to orbital velocity and get out and, and do it that way, that'd be fantastic. And that's saving a lot of money because you can re reuse the rocket. So that's that's smart. Okay, so um, now can you share a story of how you've helped one of your clients overcome obstacles and succeed? Well, um, let me tell you, I was the chairman of the Johnson Space Center Small Business Council. Um, the mission of that council is to have all the small businesses and help them to grow and succeed. So what I did, uh, by the time that uh, I was chairman, we had like 150 members. 
I believe that I left that with about 600 companies. Mm -hmm. um, and what I did is just say, uh, here are the rules. This is the playbook. Uh, I explained them every single lesson that I learned. Like, okay, you don't have past performance. Catch 22. Nobody's going to give you a contract. Team with somebody. Just uh, have networking events. Hey, you are company A. You have this capability. This guy has the past performance. Try to team. Just trying to explain everybody how to play network, trying to uh, push some uh, team, uh, team in agreements between companies. And at the end, uh, I have companies and they succeed and they say, well, thank you so much for your help. Uh, because <clears throat> all the information is uh, on the NASA's website, but it's hard to read. If, it's, if you're trying to get a contract, um, NAS is different, uh, completely different to any other entity. Mm -hmm. So, and it's very easy to play, but the playbook is completely different. So just explaining the rules, uh, how something so simple, uh, for example, with NASA, we, we never speak something bad about other company. So mm -hmm. we always speak in a positive way. Uh, I was telling them, hey, you never will hear a boy telling bad stuff about Lockheed Martin. So when you are trying to get a contract, you say, hey, this company, they are doing fantastic. They are doing a terrific job. Now, if you give me this opportunity, I can take this to the next level. So that's how uh, you can get a contract. And that's a simple lesson, but that's NASA's culture, like a very positive environment. Um, I, I believe I really help uh, some companies, um, new companies that they just started and they they reach to me and now they are succeeding. They are getting contracts. So if you could distill that down to a moral, what would be the moral of the story? Morally, it's, um, I believe in the movie, Pay It Forward. So essentially it's like a loop. So if essentially I can, I can help a company to succeed, uh, at the end, we will have a better technology. And at some point there will be more opportunities to develop more technology. And everybody will have an advantage of that. Um, just to give you a re, uh, an example, uh, NASA has two holographic computers on a station, the HoloLens. Mm -hmm. We are one of the companies that are developing applications. But right now, there are at least 20 companies that are developing applications for NASA for the holographic technology. So every time that you try to help with a project or with a technology and you succeed, you are opening the door for other companies to succeed. So I believe it's like pay it forward. Just try to do something nice and at the end, everybody will have a benefit. And if somebody do that, at some point you will have a benefit as well. Hey, great, that's a wonderful philosophy. So um, so you, you talked about certain things that you, you're giving lessons learned. So, uh, you know, can you again summarize the common pitfall, pitfalls or mistakes that people have to keep in mind? You said talk about you know, past performance, um, and being positive, et cetera. Is there anything else? Uh, quality, that's number one. Uh, number two, do your homework. Um, what I tell a lot of companies, by the, end, by the time that an RFP, a request for proposal, it's on Facebook subs, it's too late. We forecast contracts four years in advance, mm -hmm. three years in advance. We use tools like GovWin. Um, so what I do is like, okay, a contract is coming three years, four years. Um, I need these capabilities. So I have three years to develop this and develop the past performance. And if I need to team with somebody, team. And then when the RFP is out, I will be ready. Um, just to give you an example, we are um, submitting an RFP it took me four years forecasting the contract, trying to have like enough capabilities, and now I'm in a position to be. So just think in advance, uh, forecast, try to have a pipeline about your projects. Um, we have a pipeline with possible projects and like uh, traffic like green, yellow, red, and that will help you to aim the, uh, your company in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah, so the so you got a long lead time. Now, once once you submit the RFP, there's another long time period there too because they got to review it, and once they say okay, the contract start date still could be months into the future, right? If nobody protests the contract, <laughs> that's the best case scenario. 
Yeah. That's true, but in the meantime, um, what I'm telling companies, is, I, and I'm, we are doing the same, you already submitted your RFP, if somebody protests that, just be ready. But in the meantime, there are the other contracts that will come and you already forecast those and you have a pipeline. Keep moving in the other contracts. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, um, just keep quality. You, we have an experience with a customer, uh, not our fault, things became ugly. And what we say is, okay, we need to deliver. We are going to sacrifice profit, but uh, the customer will remain we remember that we deliver on time with quality. They they will not say, oh, uh, they sacrifice profit. So it's what the customers are looking for, solutions, not problems. Um, I'm um, part of the alumni of the Disney Institute, and something that I learned is like, it's not my fault, but it's now my problem. And essentially it's what we are doing. Okay? Uh, if something happened, we are here to fix it. You, I'm your vendor, you are my customer, I will take care of this. You don't need to worry about that. So the contract vehicles that you submit, are they uh, time and materials or is it firm fixed price? Or? Uh, both. We have uh, some fixed price, where some have timing materials. Uh, we provide services and products. That, that's the, um, the straight answer. Uh, but as a contract vehicle, we can use it for other projects. The ones that are for services, I just can have another uh, new project, a new idea, and say, hey, I have a contract vehicle. Can I use it? And then NASA can put money there. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of products, that's fixed price, and there's nothing to do or very little to do. Uh, but that contract can grow. But the difference, and I believe um, most of the people understand this, but with services, you can increase your contract and bring more stuff. Mm -hmm. um, with a fixed price is like you are going to deliver exactly five computers and that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, yeah, there's there's pros and cons with for each. Um, so the I guess did you have to really then closely monitor the hours delivered so you don't over you stay within a, a band like the firm fixed fixed price? We we have it. Um the CEO of my company, uh he used to be CEO for several companies. Uh, he's 76 right now. Um, he really monitors that very close. He's, um, he used to be an Air Force pilot, uh, but he really monitors hours essentially because we need to track cost. We need to audit ourselves. The government is going to audit um, ourselves. And if you are a subcontract, you need to submit all your information if you are a subcontractor. So we need to track every single expense, uh, time, and just try to uh, to meet those requirements. Like if I have 480 hours to fulfill a contract, I need to do it in 480 hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so from as a small business, I mean, how, how many people do you currently have now? Well, um, direct people we have like 12 uh, subcontractors. We have like uh, or contractors we have like 60. Oh, okay. uh, what is a huge advantage in my case, we have, I believe, all the generations. We have silent generation, we have um, uh, baby boomers, Generation X, and millennials. Mm -hmm. And when you combine the four generations, the first 20 minutes, 20 minutes you will have a war. But after that, with everybody understand the role, uh, you can have great ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just... Thinking though, with the being you know, twelve people, maybe sixty subcontractors, all this other reporting and everything has got to be kind of burdensome. You know, it's, it's easier to do when you're larger, but when you're small. <laughs> yeah. Thinking about your past life, what was a defining moment in your life that led you to be where you are today? Uh, that was very clear. I believe the first memory I was four, and I really had a deep interest about space. I had my uh, my space suit, my mom showed me those pictures and I was wearing that every single day and my mom was a little mad about that, like I need to wash <laughs> it, but um, I really had that interest since I was four. Uh, my thesis for my uh, bachelor's degree, it was about uh, propulsion, space propulsion, it was antimatter. So I always aim to space and trying to provide solutions outside the box. Uh, what I proposed by that time is say, okay, Fuel, 
it's expensive for every pound of cargo you need to provide x amounts of fuel just to leave orbit so it's uh for if we plan to travel to mars or beyond it's going to be very expensive by that time i propose antimatter maybe we're going to use that maybe we're going to use electric propulsion mm -hmm. but my my, um, my purpose is just to provide different ideas um, that can just bring solutions outside the box and make this more affordable because if we are really planning to go to mars or explore uh europa jupiter's moon that maybe there's life there we need to develop new technology yeah. Yeah, no, that's a you know that's that's the problem. You know, the distances are so vast that you need some way to kind of shorten the time it takes to get there and come back. Well, let me tell you, I'm um, I'm working on a paper because what we are discussing is isolation and the effects of isolation in astronauts. Yeah. Imagine a trip to Mars, four to six months just to be there, six months to get back, plus maybe a year. Uh, Six months, I don't know if you have seen Orion, but it's a very small capsule. It's bigger compared with, with Apollo, but imagine being there for four months. Here, if you have all the movies of Netflix, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a deep psychological effect for that. Yeah, I would, you know, what I'm thinking, I mean, I, I'll talk with you, you with this offline, but is um, having some immersive reality type of thing where you can actually feel that you're surrounded by people and at home, rather than a tin can traveling millions of miles. We are developing something different. Um, that's a great idea. It's called holoportation. So essentially, we will be able to holoport family members or, and also uh, co-workers, but family members uh, to Orion. And then the astronauts can holoport in theory to Earth. Oh. So that may be a way to mitigate that. Uh, however, from here to Mars, we have an eight-minute delay in communication. That's right. Um, I was talking with Vinton Cerf. Uh, Vint Cerf is a friend of mine. He was one of the developers of the internet. Uh, he's at Google. He's developing something called interplanetary internet. Mm. The, the goal is to try to solve that delay in communications. But in the meantime, right now, if, if we try to implement that, and send somebody to Mars today, we will not have that technology to do yeah, that kind I don't of know stuff. How, how you get over the speed of light, because that's that's what's limiting you is the speed of light. Yes. Okay. All right. So now, um, in, in a similar vein, would you please share an experience you had that still influences you, how you approach business today? Well, I have um, different people that influence me. I have. Um, uh, Three mentors, one of them is Sam Boyd, the CEO. Um, they have been mentors for me because this is a new environment. Uh, I have been a business man for, since I was 18. Uh, different businesses, textile factories, real estate, uh, construction, traffic lights, green energy, but aerospace, it was completely new for me. Uh, so I have been learning from people like Sam that he has been a mentor for me, trying to guide me and see, okay, this is what you need to do. Here are the rules and you need to follow this. Um, I have receiving a lot of mentorship from NASA. Uh, NASA has an office called procurement. So they are great mentors like, hey, okay, you need to do this and that and influence me in a positive way. Um, and in the other, uh, can just influence i have received influence from books from people like stephen hawking people that i didn't uh, meet but um i had the privilege to meet neil armstrong in person oh. boss aldrin um these people that just staying with them um spend an hour with them it's a deep influence especially for me to keep moving because they told you like okay you watch a movie and everything was so nice <laughs> but we had all of these problems during this trip mm -hmm. and nobody tell you about that uh, we just figure out like a failure is not an option and if something fails just do your rest and keep going keep going and you need to succeed yeah well i know when, when i was working on the shuttle program there was all kinds of um workarounds for different failures and one of them was that i guess if the uh, the, the cooling system um, went down with the operating manual 
roll in the tube and you get stuck in it and you can then blow air through the center of the Yeah. Um, and let me tell you, there is a lot of, um, do you remind me a case now that we are working with Raytheon about the NBL? I'm just changing a little bit the topic. Um, an astronaut was rowing on space. I don't know if you read about the story, the Italian astronaut. Yeah. He has a leak on the spacesuit. Wow. His helmet was full of water. Mm. And when you're in space, the water flows completely free. So the water came from up top to bottom. So the first part, his eyes was completely covered. <laughs> he had no clue about where to go. Mm. Uh, he was almost rowing, trying to look down, trying to get some air. And just because a trainer that he took uh, here on Earth at the NBL, he knew exactly where every single component of the station were. And he just can maneuver blindly and get onto the station. Mm. Um, when I spoke with him, I said, well, how you did it? How did you manage the stress? Uh, what's the lesson? And he said, well, just I knew that I couldn't see anything. I only knew that I need to be on station, be safe, not fail, and just keep a cool mind, remember my training, and do it. And that's one of the lessons that I learned from too many people uh, during stress. Just keep cool, uh, keep your mind focused, and, and proceed. And I, in my mind, I, I always have seen every problem like an opportunity. And it's something that I have learned from different mentors. Yeah, now that's a testament, too, for being um anticipating different types of failure modes or to constantly drill and drill and practice. And so then when you encounter something that you out of the ordinary, you can rely on the training and then work through it. Can you imagine if you hadn't been experienced to, to because you, you think you're on the, on the ground and you think, well, you just move your head around, that'll move the water and it's not going to move. I, I, I believe it was a tough experience. Uh, but I believe it's, it's part of just keeping a cool mind and train and focus on that task. And the lesson for the business is in businesses, you always have issues and you, somebody will try to sue you or somebody will try to protest a contract. You are focusing in a new contract, in a new RFP or deliver to your customer. Just keep a cool mind, focus on the task and then focus on what is not relevant later. Mm -hmm. So, what does success look like for you, personally? Well, uh, in my company, success, uh, I'm aiming to be a large prime in aerospace, defense, oil and gas, and medical industry. So that's my goal for the next five, six years uh, for that company right now. Okay. And right. create a legacy for my children. So I'm looking uh, to create a company that if I'm not here, the company will have enough procedures to move forward. So you had early on at four years old, you were very interested in space and aeronautics. What about your children? Are they, are they exhibiting the same interest or their interests lie someplace else? Well, my son has an interest about football. Uh, mm -hmm. He's a Patriots fan, but he also have a very good interest about space. My daughter too. What I'm doing, I'm taking them to every single unity that I can. Um, I took them uh, for a launch. Uh, we launched um, a sample, like an experiment to the space station in Virginia last week. Mm -hmm. I took them with me to the launch and they launched also uh, two pieces. My son launched a crucifix and my daughter launched a bracelet that will be in space. Yeah. Um, I tried to involve them in every single step. Uh, we had another mission that was very interesting. It's called NASA NEMO, NASA Extreme Environment uh, Missions Operations. We have a, la a lab undersea that mimics the space station, so the astronauts train there. And we had this holographic uh, training that I was describing. Uh, so we have physicians in Houston, JC physicians, NASA physicians in Houston, uh, helping astronauts during a medical emergency in Florida underwater mm -hmm. and what I did I took my kids with me and say okay you are going to work you are going to perform and you are going to learn and it's what I'm trying to do just sharing what I know and right now they have an interest in space they want to be like daddy <laughs> maybe that will change in a couple of years 
Yeah. But the point is, uh, at some point, they will learn whatever is going to be uh, their goal in their lives. At least they will learn something from me. But right now, they're going, they want to be like me. Okay. So can you share some measurable outcomes that um, you and your company have achieved like in the last 12 months? Well, in the last 12 months, uh, we nailed three contracts in three different um, <clears throat> fields. Uh, one was with Telen and Brown, uh, holographic technology, um, Lockheed Martin manufacturing components for a spacecraft, and Raytheon uh, um, Neutral Buoyancy Lab, providing some uh, virtual reality stuff that was completely different from mixed reality. Uh, so trying to accomplish three different contracts in three different fields with not enough past performance and perform well, I believe that was a, an accomplishment that we did in 12 months. Mm -hmm. Trying to get three, three contracts with the three big guys. Ah, cool. So now, so now you should have plenty of past performance that you can then use to win more work. I'm trying to. Uh, we have been also dancing with companies like Slumberger, Anadarko, Oil and Gas, uh, medical industry. Uh, but right now, I, it's one step at a time. And my goal is in two, three years, just have enough past performance to be prime in the main industries. So as a CEO, uh, what are your top three capability challenges or concerns? Well, the first one is, uh, use data and forecast correctly. You, I can forecast contracts, I can forecast the output, uh, but we have something, when we have proposals, we have something called gates, and during those gates, it's like a go or not go. Try to bid for this contract, and uh, making a proposal can be like 1% of the contract value, so it takes a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the biggest challenges. Uh, do we have what we require to bid on this contract? or not. So just uh, try to take the right decision with the right data. That's number one. Uh, number two, innovation. Um, there is, I believe in my case, it's easy just to see, okay, I have these contracts. I will have contracts for the next four or eight years and just sit, relax, and recover my money. It's not like that. We need to innovate. There's somebody that will come tomorrow with a better idea. So if we don't innovate, uh, during the long run, it's uh, somebody's going to do it. And that's challenge. How, how can we innovate? We have a lot of ideas. I have different generations. Everybody had a different idea. And say, okay, uh, from these ideas, let's explore this one. We are going to invest my, our money. We are going to invest our resources. And we're trying to create something successful. And the other one is education and prepare myself. I need to understand more about technologies, uh, try to understand more what I'm proposing to propose something better. So what I do in every single contract, I take an active role. I learn, for, for example, for the manufacturing contract with Lockheed Martin, I learn how to use every single machine, every single software component. So that way I can really understand and see how can we improve or what to ask to my employees. So that's another challenge. Just uh, invest money in my education, prepare, read, learn, and learn from others. Uh, just both of my years to listen, double of time that I'm talking. Okay. So um, now, uh, with, with government contracting, a lot of times you are kind of, your hands are held by what's in the contract requirements. So to be innovative, how much flexibility do you have? Because if you wanted to, so all of a sudden, it's a brand new technology. Can you do that or do you have to sell the idea first? I need to sell the idea first. And that's a problem because that's a modification to the contract. The contract says you are going to do exactly this. Uh, technology changes very fast. So I say, okay, you know, there is a new technology and we can provide this improvement. Uh, and that's going to save you money. I need to create a full case. Like it's going to save you money. It's going to save you time. Uh, you just need to change this application uh, and a lot of selling uh, to have that modification in the contract. Yes, yeah, so you have to build a full business case. This is really great. And this is gonna... When you go to submit the contracts or you talk to different customers, like getting outside the federal space, oil and gas and medical, what are the most important questions your customers should be asking 
when they consider using you? Why you? Yeah. Why I should read off from my previous vendor and use you? And that's the main um, answer, like, okay, this guy is doing fantastic. I can take this to the next level. I can save you money, provide you more quality. But that's a common question. Why you? Mm -hmm. And it's like a relation. It's like, um, I was comparing that when you are dating with somebody and then you are dating with somebody different. Okay, why should I change? Why I need to choose you? Mm -hmm. Okay, so so what distinctly? So you've talked about you know different things, but you know the, the your competition. How how big is your competition for the type of work that you are delivering? It's growing exponentially. Um, that technology, there are a lot of guys, smart guys, developing new technology, and the competition is huge. The advantage that we have right now is fast performance. Okay. Um, but however. Uh, we we cannot rely on past performance. We need to invest more and innovate more than the other guys. Sure. Uh, so that's a combination of right now I have past performance, but I need to innovate because there are thousands of companies that can provide the same services that we provide. So now you've been in business for several years. If you had, if you were to, to start AX, AXA over again from scratch, what would you do different? What would you keep? Well, forecast. That was one of my uh, main problems in the beginning. Just trying to find contracts, trying to uh, create alliances with companies when the contract was like one year uh, close to the recompete process. Uh, that's the biggest lesson. Like you need to forecast four years in advance at least. You are trying to get something and aim. So if I will change something, that will be the first thing. All right, so we are rapidly running out of time. We could keep going on and on, but I want to honor your time this morning. So how can people get in touch with you or contact you, Fernando, to learn more about you and AEXA? Well, um, I have my website, uh, www.aexa.com. Uh, my email is fernando at aexa.com. If they want to shoot me an email, please do it. Um, and I'm also on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. So I'm in all the social media. Just follow me and I will be glad to answer any questions. Okay, wonderful. So thank you so much for your time today, Fernando. I really enjoyed listening to you tell your different stories. I like your advice about, you know, it's, it's not my fault, but now it's my problem, so I need to fix it. That's, that's a really good attitude. So once again, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for your time and this opportunity. It was a privilege for me. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the Business Performance Podcast with your business coach, Henry Schneider. For more episodes and business strategies, please visit welcome.ppqc.net backslash blog. That's www.welcome.ppqc.net backslash blog. And remember to subscribe so you can get the latest episodes. Thank you.